Okay, so let us get ourselves going again. What I'm going to do is I'll return to that takeoff window, and we've pulled across a couple different items, and we can keep on pulling across all these different items one at a time, trying to keep track of which ones we've brought in and which one we haven't brought in. Okay, and that might actually be a very important thing to do. If, for example, I have one model and you're giving me another model, I only want parts of your model. I don't want to get your entire model. You just, I just want to get your structural elements out of your model to combine with my architectural model. And I have some third elements over here and I want to pull them in. I can get them one at a time and get that level of control. But it takes work. You know, and then you have to kind of keep track of which ones you have, which ones you don't have, because it will pull things in twice. Okay, so you have to watch out for that. But as some of you have discovered, there's actually an easier way to do all this. And let me show you what that looks like. If I just go ahead in here and I just let me delete those out of there, say goodbye to all those things. So I'm looking at a big blank takeoff again. Okay. I can actually say, let's just grab everything out of the Revit model, okay, which is really a very quick operation. We can say takeoff. Then I can just pull the entire model, or I can search or just grab the things that are in my current selection. I'm going to go through and just pull the entire model, because that's actually really quick. And what it's going to do is just transfer the entire structure in exactly the same mapping as the view it came out of. Let me close that. 599 objects came across. Oh, actually, you know. I have to be careful about doing this, though. I have to be just a little bit careful about doing this, I think. And that is because I believe in this 3D section view, not all the elements are showing, Okay, because the section box is turned on. So don't be deceived by that. Let me delete that out again, and let's try this again. Let me instead see if I can get to. Oh, where do I have to get to? Is it doc? Thank you. I just have so much trouble navigating around here. Okay, get the full model view. Okay, and then I say take off. Okay, the 599 gave me a little clue that I was looking at the wrong thing. Because I know there are more elements in this total model. Okay, there's actually 1,339. I could have missed the entire model right there. Okay, so if we look at this hierarchy, and again, it's just a hierarchy. What it's done is just brought over the same exact hierarchy as the model was set up in Revit. Now, if you want to sort of estimate things using this hierarchy, super. The nice thing about just sort of sticking with this hierarchy is every time you bring a model over for Revit, everything's mapped to the structure already, so you don't really have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Okay. Eventually, when you have a model or a catalog that has your rules organized in a different way, you'll want to put it into your own format. But for what we're doing here, you might as well just stick with the Revit format, since that way, if you go through and update the model and bring them back in, everything still looks the same. And the rules will already be set up. Okay, so let us think now about how we start doing our estimate. Okay, we got our quantities across. If, for example, I take a look down here at the doors. You'll see here are all those doors, the flush doors, the single glass doors, all those different doors. Okay, let's think about what we do. There are really two ways at which we could do this. There's sort of a way where we can sort of assign specific labor and material costs to each of these specific items. Okay, so for example, the 36 by 84 doors, we could assign a specific materials cost or just a total cost for that door just right against that one item. Okay, or when we get a little further down and start doing detailed things, we can set up a more detailed structure that says, well, there are going to be laborers, and there's going to be carpenters, and they have an hourly rate. Then we have different types of materials, and that has a rate per square foot. And we can do more calculated or complex calculations to get to those numbers. For what we're doing today, it's OK to go through and just do the higher level, just kind of wedge the numbers in there. But as you go deeper into this whole process, you'd probably want to start setting up assemblies. I'll show you both ways. Okay, Let's start with the whole idea. Here's this guy. Here's this 36 by 84 door. We want to sort of start associating some things with it. You'll see it is a count item right now. The count item means that we're just going to sort of assign things per door. Okay. 
If I right click on that and say properties, you'll again get the choice whether it's a count item or a linear item, whatever, it's gonna make, whatever it is that's going to make the most sense. If I go over to cost data now, I can go through and actually put in a materials cost and a labor cost for that door. Or I can sort of just wrap those all together. If I was just going to hire a subcontractor to come in and just install doors, oh, maybe that's $800 a door. Or I can go through and say that my materials cost is maybe $500 a door. Okay, and the labor cost is maybe $100 a door. Either way, whatever's going to sort of make the most sense. And where do I get those numbers? It's either coming from my experience based on putting doors like that in in the past, or it's coming out of a cost resource book so that I just get some preliminary numbers. Okay. The important thing for what we're doing here is the n better the numbers you can put in there, you know, the better our estimate's going to be. The important thing is, though, don't just leave them as zero or omit them from the estimate. Everything has a number, and it's much better, even if you just put $500 in for every door and it's way off, that's still better than being zero for the door. Okay, because I'd at least like to have a placeholder in there that we can start uh, adjusting, and I'd, I'd rather sort of err on the side of your estimate being overly conservative than as opposed to completely leaving out things and then wildly underestimating the cost. Okay, so put a number in there. We'll say okay. Not a whole lot seems to be happening. Let's go down to the little workbook view. I'll go into the doors tab. Take a look. You'll see there actually are 24 doors listed under there. Not a whole lot of cost information just yet. Let's go ahead and make that workbook show that information. And to do that, what I'm going to do is get up here to the heading and right click. And I can say, let's take a look at that labor cost. And let's take a look at that material cost. And it's a little deceiving because they're over here. I'm going to shrink up that. Actually, let me just take out the remarks column. Maybe that'll be easier. Okay. So you can see what's starting to happen in a very spreadsheet-like way. It's going through and just saying 24, 100 of those. So that's $2,400 in the labor. 500 for each of the doors on the material cost. So that's 12,000 there. So it's really just acting like a little spreadsheet, and that's the basic mechanism we're going to do. We're going to go through and for each of our different items, associate some sort of cost, either by count or by area or by linear foot, and just let it sort of start racking up the cost for us. Let me go back to take off again. Let me go for the uh, single flush doors. I'll say properties of those doors. OK, again, that's going to be a count item. For the cost data, It'll probably cost me about the same amount to put each of those in. I'm not going to let that change. But they're probably a little bit cheaper. Doors that are just big fixed panels versus doors that have glass panels are a little bit cheaper. Maybe that's going to be $350 for each of those. I'll say OK to that. And you'll see what's going to happen is the numbers are rolling up because now under single flush, okay, we actually have some numbers in there. We know that there's nine of the 30 by 60 doors with no trim, but we don't have any cost associated with them, so they're still hanging around at zero. Okay, so the exercise is really to go through and just start putting things together. Okay, now you don't have to keep things completely separate. I like keeping them separate based on the Revit categories because that makes it easier. But I could go ahead and just push those doors. Oop, I have to do it up in the takeoff window, excuse me. I could push those doors just into the same category as these doors. Okay. And now all 21 of them are going to use the same rules. Actually, is that true? Let me take a look. Nope. It still has, it's on the group by group item, so I still have to do it there. So if I choose to push them all around, that's really just a matter of just how I'm trying to organize things and group things for the purpose of the estimating. Let me go back at the takeoff, and I'll bring them back down again just to kind of keep it straight in my own brain. So each of those different items, each of those different items, which is a high level grouping that associates with some sort of number there, you have to go through and put some sort of data in and decide what you're going to do about it. Now, a few other types of items that aggregate up a little bit differently are, for example, railings. Railings are typically done as a linear foot item. So I can choose, for example, these guardrails, okay, the group of the guardrails. And I'll go ahead and take a look at those, say properties. Linear is a good assumption for those because it really is based on how many linear feet of railing. 
I can go to the cost side and say, OK, what's that going to cost? Maybe if I just buy railings, I subcontract out the railings, and I'm not actually going to manufacture or install them myself, so I'm just going to hire someone to bring them in. Maybe that's going to cost me, oh, for this guardrail, maybe about $500 per lineal foot. I'll say OK to that. It's not showing up here in the workbook because I just need to add that column in. Oops, something's not quite right. Let's take a look at what's going on there. 500 for all those railings doesn't sound right. So let's go back and take a look at what I did wrong. I think I must have defined my formula a little wrong. Come back over here to the properties. And I'll say, ah, it's not just 500 times 1. It's 500 times the quantity length. If I say OK to that, there we go. There was a $33,000 mistake. OK, so. Important to go ahead and use a little common sense as you do it. So we can do things like railings. Let me go ahead and get another railing in there. Let's say for the handrail, the pipe rail, they're a little bit shorter. Let's say those, oh, they're a little bit shorter. Quite, not quite so much material, also linear. Maybe it'll be $450 per lineal foot. Again, where am I getting all these? I'm sort of getting these numbers out of a cost guidebook or something. Just some sort of number that's going to be an assumption that's better than zero. And very quickly, you can start to see that I'm just racking things up in terms of the labor costs, the materials cost, the subcontractor cost. I could also show the total cost. Let me do that. We'll go over here and I'll say, just show the column for total cost. Okay, so I got about $70,000 worth accounted for right now. Let me actually put the remarks column back in. Let's say that, for example, in the railings category, let's just put a comment in there. For example, have no idea on this one. Better check on the next. Okay, You can leave little notes in there for other people to kind of you know, assign your own level of certainty to some of those different things. Give some indication about where you're just sort of wildly pulling numbers out of the air versus things that you want to look up a little bit later. So go ahead and for each of these different items, understand really where you want to focus your attention. Actually, another really good thing to do with this whole table is, watch this. Let's see if I can sort it. No, I can't sort it that way. OK. There's this principle called, what was it? Uh, it's not parametric. Who's parametric estimating now? It's you go through, and if you really go through and take a look at all these different numbers in terms of the total cost, if you were going to spend like another half hour researching a number and trying to get better about this, the one that's probably the one that's worthwhile looking at is the $51,000 number. Okay. If it's a subcontracted item, then you don't really have to worry about it very much because that's a fixed cost to you. But go ahead and focus on the ones that have the highest numbers associated with them. Because in terms of making a difference, if it turns out that it's not 450, it's actually 425, you'll make the biggest difference there. So you know, even as you're going through and doing your preliminary estimates, it makes sense to sort of focus your energy where it's going to have the biggest impact. And where it typically has the biggest impact is on the highest dollar figure numbers. So yeah, those are the good ones to research further. If I'm not quite sure about the cost of the doorknobs and the difference is going to be somewhere between 50 and $52, it's probably not worth my time compared to figuring out some large number that's going to swing us $100,000. Okay, Let's take off just a few more over there. We'll take off, oh, let's take a look at, for example, the ceilings. That's more of an area. I can take a look at that. I'll say properties. That's more of an area type of thing. Assign a cost to that. Let's go through and say, oh, it's going to cost like $5 per square foot for the materials, and maybe it costs $2 a square foot for actually installing that stuff. Say apply to that. And then if I go back in here and look at the ceilings, you'll see all of a sudden I have, 
$128,000 worth? I got a lot of ceiling in there. Jeez. That's a number I might want to look at a little bit more closely. Okay, because that's an awful lot of area. Okay. But the idea is, uh, what did I want to tell you about that? Ceilings, compound ceilings. Yeah, let's just leave it at that for now. I had a really important point, and I've lost it. But it'll come back in a second, no doubt. Really? Oh, what tends to happen, it's, this is sort of just something that gets messed up. Go ahead and say apply, accept it, then come back in. It'll come back. It'll, it'll come back. Yeah, exactly. In the scheme of bugginess, go ahead and try that again. So you're seeing like just one or blank, or choose the blank. Did it come back? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Don't you love that? Okay. Here's what I wanted to tell you. It didn't pop back in there. The idea now is what's happening is we're leveraging the strength of the model to go through and compute the, uh, the quantities. We do know with some certainty that there are however many square feet of ceiling that we think there are. Okay. We're not making our error there. We still might be making an error in terms of just sort of the cost that we're associating with them, but we've at least reduced that one level of uncertainty. We're letting the model take care of that. And the nice thing is now, if we go through and update the model and start changing the ceilings over there and we bring it back in there, okay, we don't have to update that quantity. The model will take care of updating that quantity and your rules for what sort of cost to apply to that element will apply to the quantity. Okay, so that's where you're getting the leverage out of this. It's a lot of work to set up the first time. Once you set up the catalog and you have all the different rules, it's really easy to do. It just takes a lot of work to set up the catalog the first time for your, for your project. Okay, but that's where the leverage comes. If you do this for the second project, you get to inherit all the good work that you put in on the first project. Yes, Ryan. Use that two. What's that? When would you use quantity two? That's a good question. Let's take a look at it. Let's see what's going on here. Is there even a quantity two? Oh, I guess we could say, yeah. Okay. There's so many cubic feet of this. You know, in the model, we could figure out whatever that is. Whatever it is you want it to be, whether that's a length, although for a ceiling, it won't make much sense. It's going to be pretty much an area, a volume, or a count. You could define some other cost that's just going to be based on that. Let me think that maybe, for example, because there are a bunch of different ceilings in here, maybe for every different ceiling that we put in, quite independent of the area, there's going to be oh, a certain amount of edging that's going to be based on the linear foot or the perimeter. Or maybe this, you know, for every room we're going to do, the subcontracting cost, they're just going to charge me $100 as a mobilization cost for each of those different things. So then I'd say just based on quantity, too. And that counts rooms? It should go through. Actually, what it's supposed to do is count ceilings. Actually, it's interesting. In this case, it's sort of it compressed it all into a single one. But it's supposed to, it's, it's, it should be for every unit. OK, I'm actually surprised that it isn't showing us more of them there. But we'll see if we can't figure out what's going on there. OK, let's do one more. We'll do the walls. Let's say that for the walls, the curtain walls, oops, I sort of moved that down there. Let me go ahead and undo that. Under basic wall, let me say the exterior walls, which are this expanded insulating foam system wall. I can take a look at them. And that's more of an area thing also. So for that, I could say that, oh, what is that going to cost us? You know, maybe a hundred, no, what is that? Let's say $15 a square foot, $2 a square foot as the labor cost. <coughs> So what are we doing here? Let's try and back up and get the high level view of it. The idea is, that's a very low cost. That must be bad. We're trying to take the uncertainty out of doing the quantity takeoff. Say, great, you got a model. The model has quantities. We should be able to grab the quantities and not have to worry about that. It doesn't take the uncertainty out of you and your expertise about how to compute the cost. You have to figure that part out yourself. That's your business issue. Okay? But at least the whole preliminary side, making sure that you get accurate quantities. That part's being taken care of for you. So that's the idea up front. Okay, Let's try looking at it a slightly different way. I'm going to go through in a slightly more detailed way to talk about how you could look at this. OK, 
Okay, not that I want you to do it for the assignment, because I think what we've been doing so far in just terms of areas, dollars per square foot, that's fine for a preliminary estimate. You don't need to go into any more detail. But for you folks who are actually trying to use this in a little more detail, let's think about how you can actually use assemblies to go through to try to construct a detail in a little more estimate, or uh, an estimate in a little more detail. Let me show you what I have in mind here. The idea is there are some sort of standard resources that we tend to use on projects. And if we have unit rates for those standard resources, we can start going through and estimating in a little more detail. For example, I could go through and set up a grouping. Oops, put it in the wrong place. Let me undo that. Let me pop back up again. See if I can just do it right down there. Say new group. Great. I'm going to create something called resources. Maybe I'll just call it labor resources as a start. And inside my labor resources, I can create some different items. I can go through and create, oh, maybe I'll create some uh, laborers. And I can create another sort of resource under the labor resources. I'll go through and create something called carpenters. Okay, Having gone through and created them, I can start actually going through and putting some rates against them. For example, if I look at the properties of carpenters, I can say I'm going to count the carpenters. Actually, what I'm going to do is count carpenter hours, okay? Because that's how I'm going to charge for them. So, for carpenters, in fact, I can change that to carpenter hours if I want to. I'll say that as a cost data, what I'm going to do is say that I'm going to use one hour for each carpenter hour, and the labor cost is going to be say fifty dollars, okay? So what that's going to do is, as I go through and assign the carpenter resource, spelled wrong, <laughs> let me fix that. Okay, every time I go through and use those, one of those, it's going to go through and charge me fifty dollars. Now the reason I do it at this level is that level of indirection gives me a way to very quickly change things. So, for example, if I move this project real quickly to another region where I have a different carpenter rate. I could change it here, and it'll change it throughout the entire estimate. Okay, so let me say okay. Let me do sort of a similar thing in the takeoff. I'll do that to the laborers. Let me say properties. I'll say we're going to count their hours. I'll even change that to labor hours to make that clearer. I'll say that we're going to give them one hour for every one of these units I use. Now, if you prefer to do this by crews, you could go ahead and say that's going to be five hours, or you could, you could choose whatever it is that's going to make the most sense to build your formula. If you're working in VICO, you know you have this concept of recipes that does the same sort of thing, where you're relating sort of physical quantities into costs. Okay, so what I'm going to do is for the laborers, oh, they'll say they're like 25 per hour. Actually. What I should do is times hours, if I'm being proper about that. Let me, in fact, I'll go back and fix the carpenters, because I did those guys wrong. Properties. Okay, So it's one hour, then it's 50 times the number of hours. Okay, That way, I can sort of put the right number of uh, work hours in there. Okay, Let me do one other item in my takeoff. I'm going to do sort of a material resource. So I'll do another group. Why would I do this? This could give me, oh, if the cost of lumber or the cost of concrete or the cost of something was something that I wanted to control as a variable, I could pull that out and be able to change it at a high level too. So I'm just going to stay with that uh, little, uh, oh, what do I do? I'll stick with the ceiling tile example as a starting point. We'll go from there. So let me go through and I'll put up a new item. Not in my group, I'll fix that in a second. You, come under there. Okay, in terms of the properties, let's take a look at that. We'll say that this is going to be an area. In the cost data, what is it going to be? It's going to be, oh, like 20 cents 
by the area. There's the whole the one thing. It's sort of messing me up there. Let me say apply it and see if I can come back again and fix that. Yep. Oh, that excellent. Let's check that out. You think it accepts the default quantity as opposed to that? Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay, so if you just leave it blank, it just sort of accepts the default quantity there. Super. Okay, let's take a look and see how we could apply this sort of scheme now instead. So I'll go back to my takeoff. And over here for my compound ceiling tiles, let's define that a little bit differently. Let me come over here, and instead of saying we have the hard cost out of there, let me assign some assemblies to this. I could say that it's going to take a certain number of carpenters. I'll say laborers, because I'll put carpenters in there. We'll let them do that. Okay. I get to say that basically it's going to be, what is it, two by the area. Okay. That'll basically go through and figure out that based on the, oh, actually, now I take that back. Two hours per, per uh, square foot, that's not very good. Let's go back to, it'll be more like, oh, 0.1 hours, which is probably 0.05 hours times the area. This is like just how long it's going to take you per square foot. Let's come up with a reasonable looking number. Say OK to that. Say apply that. Let's come back. And now we'll actually go through and apply some material. Notice if I go through and do it as assemblies as opposed to cost data, yeah, you know, it'll wipe everything out and it'll comp compute it strictly as the uh, aggregation of all the assembly items. Okay, see, so you, you sort of go one way or the other. For what you're doing, cost data is fine. For what we do eventually for a con detailed construction estimate, you typically get down to the assembly level. So I'll say, great, let me go ahead and add in there. We have to put that material resource in there, the ceiling tiles. What's that going to be? That is going to be, actually, let's just say one, because it's actually so many square feet of the material. Let's see if this actually works out. I think that's the way it should work. Because the area, we're like passing numbers through a series of filters. OK, not quite yet, but we'll see what's going on. OK, over here, let's see what happened there. 18,000. OK, we divide it, we multiply that by whatever it was, like 0.1 or 0.05. Actually, let me make this easier for us. Let me just put one times the area in there, because that'll make it easier for us to at least see what's happening with the formula. OK, if it was one hour for each of the unit of the square footage and was by 50, we'd end up with $919,000 there. OK, so we, our formula seems to be working right. Let's go back and change the formula so that it actually sort of relates to what we really want it to be, which is, OK, instead of being 1 times area, let me make it closer to 0.05 or something like that. OK, I think we're good on the material, on the labor side. Let's go ahead and fix the material side now, too. I know there has to be more than 20 cents in there in terms of all that material, so I must have defined my formula wrong. Let's take a look at that. I think in here, I think I have to put in like one times the area. Try that. Because I actually want the square footage to pass through. We're sort of learning about all this stuff. I'll say apply to that. Beautiful. OK, so what's happening in here? It's taking that 18,000. It's taking that area. It's ending up at $3,000. Let's figure out why that is. And that is because if I went back to my resources, and my ceiling tiles. Let's go ahead and test this. I said that it was about 20 cents per square foot. Let me just try a dollar per square foot. This thing where I keep on going back and changing into a dollar just gives me some confirmation that my formula is right. Okay, once I've computed, uh, con confirmed that my formula is right, okay, beautiful. If it was a dollar a square foot, it would pass through as an even dollar. But what we're doing now is <laughs> going back and changing that so we can give it a better property. Let's say 20. Point two there. <coughs> Point two. Got it. Can 
we're aggreg aggregating that stuff up. Okay, so the idea is we're just going to take those quantities, keep on associating costs with them, let it go through the work of going through and computing the spreadsheet of all the different items so that in the end, you can let it come up with the total number is, and we can sort of see where we're coming. Again, this number, it's misleading in that it's showing it down to the last dollar and cent. Given the accuracy of all our assumptions, they're sort of a garbage in, garbage out thing. It certainly isn't exactly that. But based on what we've done so far, I'd say you know plus or minus the quality of our assumptions, you know we're actually doing okay in terms of getting something. It's really just a, a calculation tool to help you out. Okay, final things you want to do with this system are as follows. Okay, the big thing is really get the quantities in there, associate the cost, let it do the work of computing what the calculations or what the estimate should be. At the tail end of this process, here's what you got to do: a couple different things. One is print out a nice report so we can take a look at all this stuff. Okay. If you print out a nice report that looks like this, I'll go to reports. We get this sort of little report generator. In some ways, this is very much like Revit's schedule table. We can go ahead and say what pieces of the hierarchy we want to put in there. And if you want to put them all in there, throw them all in. Okay, that'll get all the different objects in the entire hierarchy. You get to say then oh, what type of report it is. A summary report will just show you the, the bottom line. It'll just really show you the, the overall figure. So I could say put in there <laughs> under columns, let me put in the labor cost, let me put in the materials cost, and the subcontractor cost. Okay. And if I say create the report, it'll do a little report generation on the database and show you that overall for that entire group of items, it's $258,000 in the estimate right now. Okay, now. That's not a, that's an okay high level report. Give me a quick answer. Let's run a different report that shows a little more information. Custom reports. I'll again get the whole hierarchy. But let me say that I only want to, let me give you a grouping. That'll sort of clump everything together and at least give me a little level, you know, a high level description of what's going on. I can choose how many levels of hierarchy I want in my grouping, maybe one level of hierarchy. I'll make it two. That's fine. Create the report. Oops, have to choose the columns again. I will say get the labor cost, get the material, the subcontracting, create the report. Okay, and you'll see that this report has a lot more detail to it. Actually, I think it does. What's going on? Hmm. Let's go back over to my report generator and see what I did wrong. You over there. Maybe I'll leave it at all. Items only. Items and objects, a group should be fine. Labor, materials, subcontracting, create. There we go. That's a little bit better. Ceilings, 49,000. Doors. It's just starting to break down all that information for you. Now, creating all these reports to print them out in this format is A-OK. -okay. <laughs> you can take that and actually submit that as your PDF file that you're looking for. Just go ahead and export that to a PDF. And when you want to export this thing, you can do that by saving. When you say, again, let me, I did that so quickly, you missed it. It's up here, it's the export report. When I choose that, I have different report formats. I can save it to a PDF file if I like. I can also save that to an Excel file. A lot of people will take the reports out of this, take them over in Excel, and import them somewhere else and do some more massaging with the data. Just use this as an aggregator. So take it over to Timberline if you wanted to do a detailed estimate and apply your cost system there. You could just use this to aggregate quantities and then do your estimating and your cost association <coughs> somewhere completely else. You don't have to do it all in the same place. So take it to whatever format makes the most sense to you. One final thing that I want you to do, though, is as follows. You can export one other thing that's a good thing to export, and that is your catalog. Okay. Why you want to export your catalog, which is this tree structure, is then if you go ahead and open a different project and you've put all the work into sort of assigning all these formulas and quantities and prices, okay, you can use this tree on a different project and then sort of you know, kind of pull the quantities and get the use the same rules. Okay, so save your own catalog. We'll call this GLK class two. Say save. And this is where the leverage comes because in your company or as you continue to work, 
what will happen is you'll have a catalog to work with, and all these different sort of rules and numbers and stuff will be set up for you. So it really becomes more taking the quantities for your project and putting them through that catalog to get the answers for this project. That makes sense? Excellent. OK, let us break for today. Go ahead and uh, head on out. Enjoy a fantastic Thanksgiving break.